Well, good Sunday morning. My name is David Kenny, and I am the pastor of Walden Community Church out here in Montgomery, Texas. And we are asking, who is the Holy Spirit? That's what we're talking about these first few weeks of fall. Because when we talk about God the Father, we can understand the idea of a father. And when we talk about God the Son, we can understand what a son is. But what happens when we say, God, the Holy Spirit? Can people only understand something that they can see or understand a concept that they know? And true, perhaps we can't see the Holy Spirit, but we all know the Holy Spirit is God. He's not a it. He is part of the Trinity. And like we've been learning these past couple of weeks, he is in every believer, and he enables the Christian to do great works for the kingdom today. Because we live in a very hard and a very difficult world, and God's Spirit working in us helps us to keep our footing, helps us to stand firm in our faith. When Jesus was here, his ministry was to teach us about God. He explained the law, he showed people grace, he brought healing to those who believed, and the role of the Holy Spirit today is to remind us of the words of Christ. The Bible says that we accept Jesus as Lord, we receive the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit resides in every single believer. The Holy Spirit marks us as belonging to God. He confirms that we are in the family. He intercedes for our prayers, he guides us to truth, he convicts the world of sin, and he sings through our voices when we worship. And maybe as we grow wiser, we understand you know, God's not a simple idea. He is more than a title, more than a label. He is more than a judge who lives up in the clouds. And, and so the Holy Spirit helps us understand God. The Holy Spirit reveals God to us. He helps us understand the mind of God. Without the Holy Spirit, you can't understand these things of God. We need spiritual eyes in order to see God and understand him more clearly. So we're continuing our look at the book of Acts and the early church, trying to find a working understanding of who the Holy Spirit is to us and how it all fits into our role as a church in the year 2020. Acts chapter 2, 37, we're going to read this again. We read this last week. It says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Peter offers a very easy formula for when the crowd asks the disciples, when the crowd asks the church, what should we do? Right? We said the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin. The crowd is convicted of sin. They say, what should we do? And Peter says three things. He says, repent, be baptized, receive the Holy Spirit. And what was the crowd's response? They did it, right? They did it. They didn't ask questions about it. They didn't say, well, I have a question. Uh, to be a Christian, do, do Christians have to repent? Do Christians have to be baptized? I have a question. What if, what if I've never been baptized? Does the Holy Spirit come into my life after the repentance or after the baptism? Or is there some sort of grace period there? Christians ask a lot of questions. Because <laughs> we like things explained, apparently. We like to overstudy everything. We like to examine everything. And what happens is that immobilizes us. We spend so much time gathering research that we never actually act. In fact, there, there, is, you know, there is no sinner's prayer in the Bible. 
There, there's no sinner's prayer in the Bible. We always guide new Christians through a prayer to become a Christian. But the Bible says it's repent, be baptized, and receive the Holy Spirit. I want to show you an example of this, show you an example of how repent, be baptized, receive the Holy Spirit, how that works. There's a story about this uh, in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 8, and it's with Philip. Okay? It says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot. And he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep he was led to slaughter and like a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opens not his mouth in his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? And then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. There it is. That's the story. That's the formula, right? That's the formula. And, and the eunuch, right, is smart enough to get it. A pagan, a pagan gets it. Hey, there's water. What keeps me from doing the same thing? And Philip says, nothing. Let's do this. The Ethiopian eunuch didn't t attend a class. He didn't attend a Bible study. He didn't take a seven-week course. He didn't fill out a form. It was repent, be baptized, receive the Holy Spirit. What's the first step? Repent. What does repent mean? Does it mean that I, I say I'm sorry? Does it mean that I apologize for my past? Does it mean that I will promise to do better in the future? No. I'll show you what repent means, and we'll use the Bible, okay? Matthew chapter 4. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. In the boat was Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called to them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now, did they take a class? No. Did they ask questions? No. Did they Google who Jesus was and then just read articles about where he stood on the hot topics? No. They what? They left their nets and followed him. Repent means what? It means leave, right? You leave your old life behind and you follow Jesus. What does it mean to be a Christian? It means I wear a cross around my neck and it acts like a good luck charm and it scares away hell. I have a really busy life and so I just add Jesus to that life. No, it means you leave your old life and you follow Jesus. The first step to being a Christian is to repent, to turn away, to leave behind. Luke 14, 25 says, now great crowds follow Jesus. Why? Because he's popular. He's the in thing right now. He might do something cool. Let's watch. There's a bunch of wannabe looky-loos, and, and Jesus turns, and he sees this, and then he separates them. He turns and he says something to thin the crowd. Luke 14, 25, now great crowds accompanied him and he turned and said to them, 
If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Jesus defines discipleship. Jesus defines being a Christian. And what is it? Leave behind your old life and follow me. A Christian is a follower of Jesus. It's funny when, when we have to ask, right? We have to ask if a political candidate or a celebrity or a rock star is a Christian. Dear, hey Google, is so-and-so a Christian? We shouldn't have to ask, right? We shouldn't have to ask because being a Christian should be evident. The sinner's prayer is not a good luck charm that gets you out of hell. Being a Christian is about following Jesus. It's about obeying Jesus. Wouldn't you follow Jesus anywhere? The formula is repent, be baptized, and receive the Holy Spirit. So what is baptism? And why do I have to be baptized? And does baptism save you? 1 Peter 3 answers this, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There, right there, there, he says it, right? He says it. He says, baptism saves you. No, he doesn't. <laughs> he actually didn't. He starts with a picture of Noah's Ark. Did you see that? He starts with a picture of Noah's Ark, and he says, those who climbed into the Ark were saved. And consequently, those who are in Christ, those who are buried with Christ, they become saved. And notice verse 21. He says that it's not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. So the outside water, he says, that washes the dirt off, he says that does not save you. That's what he said. He said it's the appeal to God that saves you. See, back then, when we had the early church, baptism was the sinner's prayer. Baptism was your confession. Baptism was your appeal to God that you were going to live a different life. We enter the water of baptism because it's a picture of a decision. It's death of my old way of life and it's resurrection to a new way of life. Baptism then connects us to God through our decision and it connects us to the other Christians. And in church circles, we call this a sacrament. We call it a ordinance. So it's more than a symbol. You know, we say, oh, it's a symbol. But symbols, symbols only represent something. But a sacrament accomplishes something. A, a, an ordinance is something that you obey. So the water doesn't save you. In fact, the water that we use in our baptism here is just Montgomery tap water right out of the hose, right? So it doesn't save you. Galatians 3.27 says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So Paul says when you come back up out of the water, we actually put on Christ. Like new clothes. You know, the old person is gone, that old exterior is gone, and now Christ permanently dwells in us. The steps are repent, be baptized, receive the Holy Spirit. And it's that last part, right? Receive the Holy Spirit, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why do I want that? Why do I want the Holy Spirit? Nobody said that that was part of the deal. 
You know, I, I, I didn't know I wanted the Holy Spirit. I didn't know I needed it because I thought, I thought that I became a Christian because somebody told me that I was bad and that I was going to go to hell. And if I didn't say the sinner's prayer, I would go to hell. I thought becoming a Christian was fire insurance. Look, I, I, I was just hedging my bets. I was just rolling the dice and seeing if this whole Christianity thing worked. Why do I want the Holy Spirit? Because those are the steps, right? The steps are repent, be baptized, receive the Holy Spirit. It's that step three. What, what do I need the Holy Spirit for? Shouldn't step three be don't go to hell? Why is step three receive the Holy Spirit? 1 Corinthians 12 says, Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So there's your answer. Why, why do we need the Holy Spirit? What's the answer? Is the Holy Spirit to save me from hell? Is it to give me superpowers so that I can perform miracles? No. Paul says that it's for the common good. Who's common good? Ours, right? The church. The Holy Spirit is for people who say, I want to live a holy life and I want to help others live a holy life. Okay. If that's you, then you need the Holy Spirit. Because you can come to church without the Holy Spirit. You can go through all the motions without the Holy Spirit. You can sit there in a chair in any church in America and you can fake it without the Holy Spirit. But we started this conversation by saying that we don't hear enough lessons, we don't hear enough sermons, we don't read enough Bible studies about the Holy Spirit. Why is that? Why do you think that is? Do you really think this is such a hard concept for people to grasp? Do you really think this is too serious of a subject, too much for someone to handle? I don't. Do you know what I think it is? It's the formula. It's not that we have a problem with the Holy Spirit. We have a problem with the formula. Repent, be baptized, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because look, you can't preach about step three if you don't preach about step one. We're never going to get it. We're never going to understand step three unless we can get our heads around step one. We miscommunicate the gospel. I remember growing up as a kid. You could ask me, why did you become a Christian? So that I wouldn't go to hell. I bought fire insurance. Christianity was a means to an end. But the answer should be, I became a Christian to follow Jesus because I love Jesus, because I can't get enough of Jesus. And now I am going to turn from my old life and I'm going to follow Jesus. I want to live a holy life and I want to help more people live a holy life. Wow, that's a big job. How are you going to do all of that? with the Holy Spirit's help. The Holy Spirit will gift me for the common good. And I want to go back to our story. Let's go back to our story in Acts chapter 8 with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. We, uh, I want to close here and I want, I just want to, I want you to notice a couple of things. Verse 26 says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza, and this is a desert place. Why? Why Philip, for, for that matter? Why was he chosen? Well, because he knows Christ. He's a, a Grecian Jew. He speaks Greek, and he's going to be led to a man who has questions, and Philip has the answers to those questions. Philip had lived a holy life, and he wants to help others live a holy life. And the Bible says that he rose and went. Did he pray about it? Did he have a Bible study about it? 
Did he ask his friends on Facebook what to do? No, he obeyed God. Philip responded in faith, not knowing why, because the angel didn't explain why. Philip trusts that God has a reason, and he knows that he can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. The passage says, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot. And he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join his chariot. So Philip ran to him, heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? Good thing Philip moved when he did, right? It was timed perfectly. He comes up alongside this coach and he hears this man from another country trying to read the book of Isaiah. Who is this man? He's probably a servant, right? Probably someone who was sent to purchase this book for their master. But on the way home, he decides, I'm going to crack it open and I'm going to read it. Now, the word Ethiopian here is a Greek term for a dark-skinned person often applied to people who live in Kush, which would be modern-day Sudan. And, and let me tell you something. This is not Philip's comfort zone. He was raised a nice Jewish boy. He would have been taught his entire life not to associate with people from other races, especially a eunuch. Why is that important? Because the book of Deuteronomy that he would have studied his whole life specifically says that damaged people cannot enter the temple. Broken people cannot be saved. But Jesus changed all of that. And Philip is learning this. And herein lies another job of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit breaks down barriers. The Holy Spirit breaks down barriers. Jesus started off with the Jewish people. Jesus had a very clear focus. He came for a very specific people. Christianity started in Jerusalem with an audience that's predominantly Jewish, of the same race, of the same culture, of the same uh, vocabulary, of the same traditions. But before Jesus left, he told the church, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works then these will he do, because I'm going to the Father. And what was the very first act of those 120 believers? They went out into the streets and they began to preach in at least 70 different dialects. Something that would not normally be possible becomes possible for the children of God because they are filled with the Holy Spirit. And now... Philip has learned that lesson. He has not forgotten it. And he continues to break down barriers in his own life. Now he is ministering to an Ethiopian eunuch of all people. Why? How? Because Philip listened and he obeyed. Philip is a follower of Christ. He was moved by God to go to the south part of the road. Why, God? What's over there? Nope. Philip is a follower of Christ, and he allows the Holy Spirit to guide. The Holy Spirit guides us. Church, I want you to understand this spirit power. I really do, because it's available to you. And when we ask for help, or when the church asks for volunteers, when we receive our calling, to go out into the Walden community and to meet those people's needs. I want you to know that you can do it. You can do it. The Holy Spirit convicts the lost world of sin. And the Holy Spirit leads that person to truth. The Holy Spirit assists us when we worship Jesus. The Holy Spirit is going to confirm that you are in the family of God. And then the Holy Spirit is going to break down barriers and the Holy Spirit is going to guide you. Church, listen. 
the Holy Spirit does all the work. The Holy Spirit does all the work. When the angels tap us on the shoulder and give us a nudge and say, I'd like you to volunteer to teach junior high boys, the correct response is, I just do it. Just like the hymn says, we trust and obey for there is no other way. Hey, what if God did ask you to teach junior high boys? Would that be such a big deal? Probably not. But go with me on this. What if God didn't ask you to teach junior high boys? Whew! Okay, okay. wow, good. Because that, that's a big ask. Okay, instead, what if the Holy Spirit invited you to build a church? Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. Hang on. Um, can we go back to the Sunday school thing? I changed my mind. W- what do you think is harder? Teach Sunday school or build a church from scratch? What's the answer? Which one's harder? The answer is neither one. It's a trick question, right? Your part is easy. Just obey. The Holy Spirit is going to do all the work. Philip obeyed. He got the nudge to walk over to a wagon and teach Sunday school to someone who needed a little help with the Bible passage. But do you know what the Ethiopian eunuch did? He went home and built a church. A second century church father named Irenaeus was a student of Polycarp. Polycarp was said to have been a student of John. Irenaeus wrote a book called Against Heresy about the Ethiopian eunuch. Acts 8 says there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, is a historical person an ancient kingdom of Cush that was ruled by a warrior queen. So when Philip meets him, the Ethiopian was going home. He didn't stay in Jerusalem. He was going on in his journey to return to Queen Candace's court. Well, interestingly enough, in his book, Irenaeus writes that this man was also sent into the regions of Ethiopia to preach what he himself believed. Christianity in Ethiopia is the largest religion in that country. And it dates back to the ancient kingdom of Aksum when the king Ezana first adopted the faith. This makes Ethiopia one of the first regions in the world to officially adopt Christianity. In fact, the largest pre-colonial Christian church of Africa was the Ethiopian church, which had a membership of over 30 million, the majority of whom live in Ethiopia and is thus the largest of all Oriental Orthodox churches. An ancient tradition says that the very first missionary to Ethiopia, a man named Frumentius, came across a Christian church that was said to have been founded by a court official. What do we do? We trust God's leading. When he guides, we listen. When he directs, we obey. This isn't a coincidence. Philip was the man led by God to be in the right place at the right time to do the right thing for God. Ultimately, what made Philip's Sunday school lesson successful wasn't his technique in evangelism. It wasn't his Bible knowledge. It was purely his obedience to God and the working of the Holy Spirit through his life. Philip did not convict that man of sin. He did not lead him to truth. He did not force him to be baptized. He did not send him home with a mission to build a church. The Holy Spirit did all of that. The Holy Spirit does all the work. All I have to do is trust and obey. Repent. Be baptized. Receive the Holy Spirit. That's the good news. 
And if we know Jesus, then that can be the person that we become. We can become a person that the Holy Spirit can use. And then, as a Christian, and then, as a follower of Jesus, I live a holy life. And I help others live a holy life. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, come. Come into our lives. Fill us with your strength and your power. Enable each one of us to receive our gifts for the common good. And that we, when we feel that tap, when we feel that nudge on the shoulder from the angels to go this way or that or to pick this up or to work or volunteer here, may we just act. May we trust. May we obey. We don't have to stop and think about it. We don't have to question. We know that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Lord, it's the, the trusting that's the hardest part for us in a world right now where we are being pulled in every which direction and, and being told not to trust anything. Right now, we are, we are told that there is nothing that we can believe, that there is no truth, that it's all lies, and we see deception around every corner. Lord, may we be reminded that your church is truth, that God is truth, that your word is truth, and that we have this to stand on. And when the world says that something is true, we can be able to hold it and compare it against Scripture and say, no, this is true. Lord, your church has the answer. As the world is looking for a place to land, a place to put their feet, a place to find footing, Lord, your church has the answer, and she has always had the answer. So may more people repent. May more of your community repent. May more neighborhoods repent, more states repent, more of our nation repent. May they turn from their old life and follow Christ. May more people be baptized, not four times a year, every day. May baptistries all across America be always filled with water. Because at the end of every church service, more people want to come up and feel the waters. More people want to go down into death and be resurrected with Jesus. And may more people be filled with the Holy Spirit. Putting aside our own strengths, putting aside our own to-do list, putting aside our own interests and what we want to accomplish, Lord, may we be filled with the Holy Spirit instead. May we go out and build your kingdom, not ours. May we go out and advance your church, not ours. And may we speak your Son's name, not ours. Lord, we love you. We are so grateful to be your children. Encourage us each day to go out into this world and to bring the outside in as we send the inside out. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching uh, with us this morning. And always remember that this is a YouTube video that has an address, it has a, a URL up at the top. You can always clip and copy it post it to your own social media walls or send it out uh, in text or by email, or you can post it to a friend's wall if you think it might encourage them this week. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.